Welcome to Shooting Straight. I'm your host, Ken Buck. In today's highly partisan environment, political adversaries often minimize each other's arguments by labeling motives rather than engaging in constructive dialogue. For the next 30 minutes, I invite you to join me as we cut through the political noise and learn about what inspires our guest and how his career in medicine and government helped to change the world. Today, we will explore what motivates him to step into difficult situations where others back away. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Ben Carson to the show. Are you ready to start shooting straight? I am completely ready. Great. <laughs> Dr. Carson, you uh, have just left uh, the uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development as a secretary of that department, the leader of that department. Uh, during your time there, you uh, innovated, you, you brought some new programs. So Dr. Carson, I, I just want to ask you about a couple of the programs at HUD. Uh, uh, could you tell us about the FYI program and, and the Envision Centers? Yes. Well, FYI stands for Foster Youth to Independence. There are about 20,000 foster youth who graduate out of foster care every year. Uh, within the next four years, about 25% of them become homeless, and a larger number are inadequately housed. And obviously, that's a tragedy in their lives. So uh, some youth actually came to us and told us about this. And we were so impressed. Our amazing staff at HUD put together a program, and we were giving out the first grants in four months. I always say we have the ugliest building, but we have the best people at HUD. And... Uh, this program not only provides housing for those youth, but also wraparound services. Because can you imagine being 18 years old and being out there on your own right. with no support? Right. And it makes all the difference in the world. So we're very proud of that program. The Envision Center program actually comes from the Bible. Uh, Proverbs 29, 18 says, without a vision, the people perish. And I noticed there were a lot of people out there perishing. They just really didn't know where where they were going or what was available. And uh, I also knew that, you know, we tend to be a pretty compassionate society and we have lots of programs, uh, you know, for people who are struggling, but they're all over the place. So we said, why don't we bring all these programs together under one roof and then coordinate that with the federal programs. So there were 13 federal agencies and with state and local programs and uh, coordinate them together so that that single mom who has three little children can come in there and find out how she can get childcare so that she can finish her education, get her GED, get further training, become independent and start teaching that to her children. And that's how we break those cycles. We've been just accumulating more and more dependent people. We have to think a little further ahead if we're going to succeed as a society. You've, you've uh, based your decisions um, uh, on your faith in part, on, on uh, your interactions uh, as a, a neurosurgeon mm -hmm. and, and uh, many other life experiences. Yes. And, and those decisions, you haven't been shy about sharing with the world. No. And, and part of the reaction to that has been just some really ugly, ugly statements by people. And I almost have to apologize for repeating sure. them, but you know, you've been called a coon, you've mm -hmm. been called an Uncle Tom, you've been called a racist. I've been called a white supremacist. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of a lot of those I, I scratch my head on, but why is it, why are people so scared, so intimidated by uh, an African American, a black man mm -hmm. who is a conservative? Well, for the left, the only thing worse than Satan is a black conservative. Why? Uh, because it blows out of the water their image of victimhood. They want to convince people that they are victims and that somebody else is creating their problems. And if we can only take back from those people or uh, somehow minimize those people, then you can ascend. Of course, that's not the case. Uh, that's not to say that there aren't and haven't been some injustices in our society, but what is the thing, what is the factor that has the most to do with what happens to a person? You know, I was a terrible student for a while. You know, my mother made me start reading books. Uh, and as I started reading about scientists 
and uh, explorers and entrepreneurs and all kinds of incredible people, I discovered very quickly that the person who has the most to do with what happens to you in life is you. It's not somebody else. It's not some circumstance. And um, that completely changed my, my thinking. I stopped listening to the people who were telling me that the system was stacked against me and that all these people were against me. And I started thinking about what I can do. And, uh, you know, I went from a terrible student uh, that everybody used to tease to the top of the class. Same students who used to laugh at me and call me dummy were coming to me saying, Benny, Benny, how do you work this problem? I'd say, sit at my feet, youngster, while I instruct you. I was perhaps a little obnoxious. But, you know, it was so great uh, because I discovered you know, how to achieve, and it made the biggest difference in my life. And there are those who don't want people to recognize that the biggest factor is you and what you do and how you take advantage of what's in your environment. They want you to totally believe that you're a victim and that you can't do anything about it and that these people are oppressing you. And uh, they can use that to accumulate political power for themselves because they say, we're the people who can help you. Not all those horrible people over there, but we're the ones who can help. Of course, nothing ever changes, but they say that. Yeah, but the, the people that things change for are those who do begin to realize the potential that lies within themselves and how to develop that. You mentioned your childhood, uh, fascinating uh, childhood and, and really growth of, of a human being during that childhood. Uh, your parents get divorced when you're eight and you're raised by a single mom yes. um, after that time. You are living in Detroit. You move to Boston. You move back to Detroit. Tell us, tell us about uh, the, the home that you lived in, yeah. the, the neighborhood. The Well, my mother was the real hero to me, you know. She came from a huge rural family in, in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Got married at age 13. Uh, they moved to Detroit. My father was a factory worker. Years later, she discovered he was a bigamist. Uh, there she was with less than a third grade education on her own trying to raise two sons. We didn't have a place to live at first, but some relatives in Boston took us in. Uh, they lived in a typical tenement large multifamily dwelling boarded up windows and doors sirens and gangs and murders my two favorite cousins were killed i mean that's the kind of place that it was uh nevertheless it, w it was a shelter uh over our heads and we were there for a couple of years and then moved back to detroit still in a multifamily uh dilapidated area but at least my mother was independent and she she wants she valued independence uh, but she was very disturbed that my brother and I were, were terrible students because she was very observant. She worked as a domestic. She cleaned people's houses. And uh, they were nice houses. And, you know, she said, how did these people get to be so successful? And, uh, you know, she studied them. And she finally concluded it was because they did a lot of reading, a lot of studying and preparation. So she came home and imposed that on me and my brother. We were not happy campers. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, in today's world, we probably would have called social services on her and she'd been taken away in cuffs. But anyway, we had to read the books. She made us read two books apiece from the Detroit Public Library, submit to her written book reports, which she couldn't read, but we didn't this know This that. is every week? Every week, every week. But it, at first I hated it, but after a while, you know, those books were more interesting than television because she said we could only watch two or three TV programs. We didn't even want to watch TV. We just wanted to read our books. Much more uh, interesting because you have to use your imagination. Which hurt more, being required to read books or being banned from uh, seeing most TV? Uh, in the beginning, it was being banned from TV. But who cares about TV after a little while? And, uh, you know, both my brother and I became stellar students uh, after that. What, what did your brother end up doing? He became the rocket scientist. So we have a brain surgeon and a rocket scientist. That's almost, there's some joke about that somewhere. It is kind of funny because, uh, you know, my mother's friends were always criticizing her, saying, you can't make boys stay in the house and read books. They'll grow up and they'll hate you. I used to overhear her friends and I'd say, mother, you know, they're right. But, you know, she didn't listen. We still had to do it. And uh, she got the last laugh, didn't she? 
Is it fair to say that your mom succeeded where the schools failed? It's very fair to say that. You know, she was observant. I remember uh, my brother, you know, they wanted him to uh, take a less vigorous academic course. And she said, no. She went there and sort of tore that place up. And she said, no, my boy's going to be in college prep. <laughs> So let's talk about college prep. Uh, you graduate from high school. You go off to uh, Yale University as an undergraduate. Were you scared? I, I wasn't scared. I, I, I was perhaps naive. I thought I was the smartest person in the world, and if not, certainly in the top five. And it didn't take long before I was severely disabused of that. <laughs> and you know, by the end of that first semester, you know, I was doing terribly in freshman chemistry, and I was going to fail. And the, the professor, uh, in his mercy, or maybe it wasn't mercy, maybe it was a sadistic uh, attitude, he said, those people who are failing, I will give you double credit on your final, just to give you that last hope before you die. <laughs> and uh, so I was up studying all night, and I fell asleep, and I dreamed that I was in an auditorium all by myself. And there was the blackboard, and the professor was doing problems on the board. When I woke up very early in the morning, that dream was so vivid, I looked up to all the stuff. That was the same stuff that was on the exam, and I aced the exam. <laughs> and I said, you know, the Lord really does want me to be a doctor. He really does. And I'm not going to make him ever do that for me again. I'm going to become a much more diligent student. And I did. And I began to, to study the right way at that point. Because, you know, I come from a Detroit inner city high school. All I needed to do was study for five minutes before an exam to get an A. That doesn't work at a high-powered Ivy League school. <laughs> <laughs> you, you go from Yale to the University of Michigan Medical School. And uh, there I had some trauma, too, because uh, the first set of comprehensive exams I did horribly on. Uh, so badly that my advisor told me to drop out. He said, you're not cut out for medicine. Just don't even torture yourself or anybody else. And you know, I said, I said, Lord, help me to figure this out. I said, what kind of courses have you always done well in? What kind of courses have you struggled in? And I realized I did well in courses where I did a lot of reading. I struggled in courses where I listened to a lot of boring lectures because I don't get anything out of boring lectures, zero. And yet I was listening to six to eight hours worth of boring lectures every day. So I made an executive decision to skip the boring lectures and to spend that time reading. The rest of medical school was a snap after that. And, you know, I remember uh, years later going back to my medical school as the commencement speaker. And I was looking for the advisor because I was going to tell him he wasn't cut out to be an advisor. <laughs> <laughs> You you then go to uh, Johns Hopkins, and and I want to ask you the same question again. You know, intimidated and scared. These are these are not run of the mill institutions. These are no. really exclusive uh, storied uh, storied institutions, particularly in medicine. I mean, Johns Hopkins is the place, and uh, and there I was. And the significance of that wasn't lost on me, but. You know, things went well through my residency, and, you know, at a, at a very young age, I was uh, appointed director of pediatric neurosurgery. Well, well, I'm going to stop you right there, Dr. Carson. It wasn't at a very young age. You were the youngest to ever been appointed to that position, and mm -hmm. one of the youngest directors uh, in the country at that point. Yes. Yeah, and I must admit, that I thought I was pretty hot stuff, you know, uh, but then there was this couple from Georgia, and their little boy had been diagnosed with a malignant brainstem tumor, and they sought the advice of many specialists, and everybody told them the same thing. Take the boy home, make him comfortable, and let him die. And they ended up at Hopkins. And they said, Doctor, the Lord let us, let us here because we'd find a neurosurgeon who could help our child. And I said, I looked at the scans. I said, this is a malignant brainstem tumor. There's nothing I or anybody else can do. And they said, but Doctor, the Lord... I said, look, I'll tell you what, MRIs were new at that point. I said, let's do an MRI. Maybe it'll show us something that the CAT scan doesn't show us. We did an MRI. All the neuroradiologists said, it's a malignant brain symptom. I told them, they said, but doctor, the Lord. I said, I, I said, look, every now and then, 
there's a mistake and it, it could be like an inflammatory reaction that looks like a tumor. I said, so I'll go in and I'll do a biopsy, but I'm not optimistic. And I went in there, opened things up, got down to the brainstem, ugly, ugly looking tumor. I that took a frozen section that came back, high grade glioma. And uh, I took out as much as I dared and I said, uh, I'm sorry, but it looks like what we thought it was. And I said, uh, you know, maybe he served his purpose in life. We'll understand it better by and by. And uh, they said, thank you, doctor. But the Lord is going to heal our son. I said, these people have more faith than anybody I've ever seen in my life. It was amazing. But I expected him to deteriorate and die. He didn't. He got better. Started handling his secretions. His eyes started looking in the same direction. I said, what's going on? I said, let's do another MRI. There was still a tumor there. But off in the corner, you could see a little sliver of tissue. And I said, is it possible that maybe this is not in the brainstem, but it's compressing and displacing the brainstem? And I said, maybe we should go back in. And they said, by all means. And I did. Under the microscope, as I peeled that tumor away layer by layer, I got to the last layer, and there was a glistening white brainstem, smashed and displaced, but intact. That boy, long story short, walked out of the hospital and is a minister today. Is a minister today. And one of the oncologists came to me and he said, I, I've never believed in God, but I do now. But uh, it was really for me because I thought I was doing all this. And I said, it's not you that's doing it all. And, uh, you know, it was a lesson in humility that I've never forgotten. And, and that was one of the first cases that you did uh, really innovative and, 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 and in some ways life altering for you. Absolutely. It was early on. But it gave me a certain confidence, uh, not in just myself. Of course, I had to be prepared for everything I did. I had to study it in great detail. But I also realized it was a power that was greater than me. And uh, I still recognize that today. One of the interesting things that, that I learned in, in doing some research on you was uh, you didn't just do one or two innovative uh, cases. You really did dozens and dozens of, of cases that other people wouldn't do. You, you, yeah. In 1987, at, a, at again, a young age, you uh, separated conjoined twins that had been connected at the, at the at back the, of the head. At the back of the head. Uh, first time that, that surgery had ever been done. And, and it was a successful surgery. And it was. Uh, and again, I had to think it through long and hard. And I said, why Why are these kind of surgeries always not successful? And it's because they would bleed to death. And I said, what could we do to keep them from bleeding to death? And I was talking to a buddy of mine, the chief of cardiothoracic surgery at Hopkins. And he was telling me, I said, when we operate on these little baby hearts, we use hypothermic arrest. We cool their bodies until the heart stops, pump all the blood out. And uh, we can operate for up to an hour, and then we have to warm the blood up, back up, pump it in, and start the heart back up. And I was thinking, I said, if we got to the critical part of the operation where we had to cut through those vessels, and we went on hypothermic arrest, and then we quickly reconstructed those vessels, it could work. And I explained that to everybody, and everybody was saying, you know, that sounds like it might work. And we put together this amazing team. Because uh, it wasn't just just all me. There, we had some really spectacular people there. But you led the team. But I led the team, and uh, miraculously it worked. Now they had some neurological deficits, but technically it was highly successful. Uh, some years later, we were able to do another case in South Africa, complexly joined twins, and they suffered no neurological uh, deficits. They are adults now. So, um, you know, the philosophy that really guided me was something I call a BWA, the best worst analysis. It asked four questions. What's the best thing that happens if I do this? What's the worst thing that happens if I do it? What's the best thing that happens if I don't do it? What's the worst thing that happens if I don't do it? And by asking those questions, you can see if you're in a situation where if you don't do anything, they're definitely going to die. And there is a possibility that if you do something that they will live, to me, that's a no-brainer. <laughs> you got to give them a chance. No pun <laughs> no, intended. No, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I even wrote a book called Take the Risk, and it really talked about situations in life that we all face. And 
you know, you can cower in the corner and, and, and just have no courage. Or you can have courage, but do it in the right way. You, you did an operation, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention I'm not sure I can pronounce it, but, but you did an operation where you removed half, half of the brain. person's brain. Hemispherectomy. Because of, uh, because of uh, intractable seizures. seizures. Yeah. Uh, tell us about that. Well, uh, I, I wasn't the first to do that. Walter Dandy was the first to do that. Uh, years ago, but the operation had fallen out of favor because it was had a high mortality and morbidity rate. Um, so I started asking myself, why does it have such a high mortality and morbidity? In it? And I started addressing all of those issues. And I said, uh, I think we can do this. And I, I remember the parents, they were from Denver, Colorado. The little girl was four years old. She says, I'm from Denverado. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we did the operation, and uh, it, it, was, it was daunting. But uh, she remained in a coma for a while, but then she woke up, and uh, she ended up doing extraordinarily well. And, and that was the beginning of a... A long string of hemispherectomies. And there, there was a lot of national attention about it, and uh, and then I then I did an intrauterine surgery, and uh, they were twins, and one of them had severe hydrocephalus, and it was threatening to end the pregnancy for both of them, and uh, I was able to do a procedure along with one of the obstetricians to alleviate the hydrocephalus. And, uh, you know, when people found out, they said, you know, that's unethical. Uh, you know, we're not ready to do intrauterine surgery yet. But, you know, doing the BWA, you know, I realized that they would both be lost if we didn't do something. And really, it was designed to save the normal baby, okay, recognizing that the abnormal one probably wasn't going to survive. Well, in fact, it turned out that they both survived. And, uh, you know, we were able to, to alleviate the hydrocephalus permanently once the birth had taken place. And funny, all the people who were criticizing said, well, I would have done that too under those circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> Monday morning quarterback. And then after that came the first set of conjoined twins. And, you know, then the news media started putting two and two together. They said, wait a minute, isn't that the same guy who does the hemispherectomy? And isn't the same guy who does the entry? You know, I said, now he's doing this. Who is this guy? <laughs> and then they went back and they looked at, you know, my history and they said, wow, this is an amazing story. And I actually became a media darling uh, for a long time until they discovered that I was a conservative. <laughs> <laughs> That'll take care of that. So it, it, it brings me to my next question. You, you, you've, you've now made a name for yourself, and, and you've got this, this great history, uh, life story, and, and then uh, all of a sudden something happens, and, and you decide you want to run for office. Tell us, tell us how you went from this comfortable life of, <laughs> of innovating and, and saving lives to yeah. feeling compelled to, to run for president. Well, uh, what happened is I was asked to do the National Prayer Breakfast in 2013, which I thought was a really strange thing because I had been asked to do it in 1997 when Bill Clinton was president. And I didn't realize that anybody ever did it twice. I said, this is very strange. A little research showed me that one person had done it twice, and that was Billy Graham. I said, wow, that's pretty good company. <laughs> <laughs> so I agreed to, to do it. And uh, after the speech, everybody was saying, you should run for president. I said, you'd be ridiculous. Why would I even think about such a silly thing? Uh, but everywhere I went, and I was doing a lot of speaking, there were people with placards, run, Ben, run. I had over 500,000 petitions in my office. And I finally said, Lord, you know I don't want to run for president. And I don't have any of the things that people who run for president have, a Rolodex with all the important names, a big bank account, uh, an organization. Uh, and I said, nor do I plan to establish one. So if you really want me to do this, I think you have to supply all that. The next thing I know, we have a, a complete organization. We're raising more money than the RNC every month. I mean, it was just ridiculous. So... So, uh, you know, I did it, 
Uh, and, uh, you know, for a while, you know, I, I even led the pack of 17 people. Uh, but, you know, it turned out in the end, I had agreed with uh, Trump. While we were running, we became friends that whoever won the other one would be in this administration. And, uh, you know, the, the area that interested me most was poverty. Uh, because I felt that we had a lot of policies in place that kept people in dependency and that we needed to move in a different direction. If you really wanted to help people, you would get them to a point of self-sufficiency where they could really realize the American dream. Something you learned in your childhood. It's something that I learned in my childhood. And I knew that it is possible to change those things. And it's still something that's very important to me. And that's why I'm still not hanging up my shingles and 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 playing golf. I got other things to do now. So you you've you you go from the uh, uh, campaign trail and you go into HUD and and you're secretary of HUD. And we've talked about some of those policies. Well, what I want to ask you is the the time that you've spent um, in in HUD and the time that you spent in medicine and mm -hmm. the time in your childhood. In your opinion, what do we need to do in America? to help young, at-risk uh, uh, people who are in poverty, uh, how do we give them a chance? How do we give them opportunity? Well, the key thing is what my mother realized, and that is don't allow people to be brainwashed into thinking that they're victims, into thinking that they have no control. Now, the, the average person with an average brain is an amazing entity. The human brain is so complex. It has billions and billions of neurons, hundreds of billions of interconnections, remembers everything you've ever seen, everything you've ever heard, can process more than two million bits of information in one second. You can't overload it. If you learned one new, sec one new fact every second, it would take you over three million years to begin to, com to, to challenge the capacity of your brain. When you have something like that, <laughs> Believe me, you can do pretty much anything, but you have to be trained to believe in your abilities. And, uh, you know, there are some people who say, I'm not good at math. I just, I'm not good at, everybody's good at math if you give them the foundation, if you teach it the right way. You know, you remember there was that Stand and Deliver, that movie of the, of the uh, teacher who taught inner city kids calculus and they were like the best around. Uh, it was because he knew how to teach it. And those, those are the kinds of things that we have to, to, to concentrate on for people. So, so giving people hope. What about the role of, of family in uh, this? You had a mother so who cared deeply, who uh, observed what successful people did and, and brought those observations back and, and put them in practical terms for you and your brother. There's, there's, there's a reason, of course, that people have parents and that they have you know, supportive families uh, when they're growing up. You need that emotional support. You need that guidance. You need the wisdom of people who've already traveled where you're trying to go. And that's the reason that we have families. And, and as that family structure breaks down, you see what's happening to our society. You also have to have faith. You know, we're throwing away our faith, our belief systems, our Judeo-Christian values that say love your neighbor and replacing those with cancel your neighbor. Uh, how can anything good come out of that? If you extrapolate, you can see all it leads to is chaos. One of the things that uh, keeps coming back to me as I read about you and, and talk to you, uh, you are pro-life. And that doesn't necessarily mean what the left wants it to mean. You, you saved lives. You saved lives when they were uh, in uterine, absolutely. When, when they were before they were born, you saved lives uh, that that others said, "Go home, make them comfortable. Right. He'll he'll pass on soon." Um, what what is life? What does life mean to you? And how does it play a role in in our future? Well, you know, also I, I operate in a, a lot of premature babies, babies that were you know twenty six, twenty seven, twenty eight weeks gestation. Uh, who would still have been in the womb for another 10 or 12 weeks. Um, 
the, the whole concept of life is so important. As much as we've learned as human beings, we still don't have the ability to give life. So we certainly should be very careful about taking it. And, uh, you know, as we become much more coarse uh, as a society in the way that we treat people, I think there's a correlation with how we value life. You know, from the womb to the tomb, you know, we've devalued, you know, that human existence. And, uh, you know, it's not just the unborn babies. It's, it's the, the, the drunks, the homeless, you know, the drug addicts, the mentally ill. Uh, we're not respecting their lives and hence not treating them the way that we should. And if we use a bit of prevention and the right type of compassion, I don't think we have nearly the problems that we have now. You've seen uh, uh, firsthand and, and certainly the effects of violence um, growing up in Detroit mm -hmm. and then in Boston, back to Detroit. Uh, what, is, what do you think that our, uh, our views towards life, how do they impact violence? Well, they make it much easier for you to take someone's life, uh, for you to try to destroy someone's life, uh, destroy their peace. You know, you, you hear people going around today saying, if that person was involved with that administration, you need to make their lives miserable. You need to torment them. You need to torment their families. I mean, that's just pure evil. Uh, it's, uh, it's hard to describe it as anything other than that. And that's certainly not the kind of value system that America was established under. And... Uh, you know, if we continue to allow that to exist, uh, the future is going to be very bleak. So just just like you had a very uh, a comfortable life um, and, <laughs> and you didn't accept it uh, in medicine and you went into politics, now you have accomplished great things at, at the Department of, of Housing and Urban Development. And you're not accepting that. You're not ready to, to retire yet. You're involved in a new project. Tell us about that new project. The uh, American Cornerstone Institute. Uh, because I can't relax seeing the direction that our country is going in. And we're abandoning those basic cornerstone principles that allowed us to rise from a bunch of ragtag militiamen to the most powerful and important nation in the world. You know, things like our faith, our Judeo-Christian values, which teach us how to relate to each other. We're throwing that out. Things like liberty. You know, some people say, well, we're still very free people. Are we? When everybody now worries about what they say and whether that's going to get them canceled. And it doesn't matter whether it's government imposed. Wherever it comes from, if the government allows it to exist, it's just as detrimental. And then things like community. You know, it's our community, our unity, working together that gave us the strength uh, as communities, which became strength as states, which became strength as a nation. That's how we were able to be propelled to the top so quickly. And most Americans actually are very community-minded. They'll help somebody. They won't ask them if they're a Democrat or a Republican. They'll extend a helping hand. That is, until the politicians and the media come and stir them up and, and make them believe that the person living across the street is their enemy because they have a different yard sign. You know, those things are just ridiculous. But that's happening to us. And it's going to be we, the people, who have to realize what's happening to us. You know, it was Khrushchev who said, your grandchildren's children will live under communism and we won't even have to fire a shot. He foresaw this, but we can stop it. And then uh, life, as we've talked about before, we have to once again get to the point where we respect life. When we respect life, then we treat everybody differently. In and Dr. Carson, if folks want to uh, learn more about uh, this organization that you are now uh, volunteering to yes. help and, and promote, 
Uh, they can go to AmericanCornerstone.org. That's correct. AmericanCornerstone.org. It, it's a think tank, but it's also a do tank. We both think and do. And, and you know, we're, God willing, going to be able to change the direction of this country and help the people who are really mostly decent people learn how to distinguish between those people who are helpful and those people who are manipulating them. So when I hear you describe uh, the solution and, and uh, the ideas that you have, it, it doesn't really take a brain surgeon to figure that out. <laughs> uh, it absolutely does not take a brain surgeon. It takes common sense. Common sense. Which, unfortunately, is not very common in D.C., but it's rampant throughout the country, and we got to use it. Well, thank God it is. <laughs> I want to ask you one last question, if I can. I ask all of our guests this question. If uh, loving this is wrong, I don't want to be right. What is this? Well, if loving America is wrong, America is more of an idea than it is a place. It's an ideal about freedom, about the liberty to live the way you want to live your life as long as that's not disturbing somebody else. It's about being able to believe what you want to believe. It's about being able to say what you want to say. It's about being able to work hard and to produce and to let that accrue to your own benefit and to the benefit of those around you. And if that's wrong, then I don't want to be right. Thank you. I want to thank Dr. Carson for shooting straight with us. And I want to thank you for listening today. I hope this program has been informative, enlightening, and uniting. As Americans struggle with the difficult issues facing our country, we are reminded that good policy is the result of open, thoughtful discussion. God bless you, and remember to shoot straight. Mm -hmm.